Chair, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, I must tell you I wear two hats. One is a politician, other is a monitoring and evaluation consultant. So I was wondering that if I wore the hat of a politician and made a speech today, then it'll be so long that I, you wouldn't be able to stop me. Because you give a microphone to a politician, he doesn't give it back. But again, I thought if I spoke as an evaluator, you wouldn't understand a damn word I said. <laughs> so I thought I, my speech should be something like a woman's dress, short enough to attract attention and long enough to cover the subject. <laughs> so I'll stick to that. So like uh, the Secretary General rightfully said uh, in his report, that strong monitoring and accountability will be crucial for the implementation of the post-2015 development agenda. I think this high-level side event focusing on empowering countries through evaluation actually is the most timely and relevant one for more than one reason. Well, I was uh, thinking that I'll speak, uh, I had a prepared speech, but I'm trying to speak from my heart because I've come a long way from Colombo, Sri Lanka to say a few words. I would like to tell you in most countries, especially the less development countries, the less developing countries and the developing countries, there's a huge dependence on donor funds and borrowed funds. And there's a lot of public sector development projects that are going on all the time. And most often, there's a huge amount of money that is being borrowed. But the most important thing is to find out whether these projects are achieving their targets and goals. And most often, how many people in the government know whether these projects are really achieving their desired targets and goals. The point is, are they also being evaluated at different stages, at the design stage or at any stage at all? Sometimes it hardly gets evaluated. Even if they are evaluated, do these reports re really reach the decision makers? the political leadership, to be able to understand the reports and to take action to correct, take corrective measures? That's a big question mark. Do politicians really get to use these reports at all? And do they use it to have evidence-based uh, decision making? These are questions that are unanswered most often. Another challenge that most countries have right now is that unlike previous days where most of the uh, funding was from multilateral agencies or bilateral agencies. Now there are, there's a access to commercial loans. Any amount of commercial credit is available in the market. There's also countries that pump in money into developing countries without any conditions. You get any amount of credit at high interest rate, monies are brought in, and governments borrow, have all kinds of projects that are going on, which ultimately results in the country being highly indebted. These are issues that have that face most developing countries. But at the same time, globally, countries are building very effective monitoring and evaluation systems to cope with the huge amount of information that is available. There's actually a, a information overload, if you ask me. But all this information is available, but is it being used properly? Is it being used effectively? That's the question. There are concepts such as management for development results, performance-based budgeting, performance audits, etc., to cope with all this information. Every country has these systems. If you ask, every developing country would have an m &E structure. But is it effectively being able to cope with it? As Winston Churchill once said, quote, true genius resides in the capacity for evaluation of uncertain hazardous and conflicting information, unquote. The important thing is to be able to get to that information and to be able to relate to that information and to interpret that information for your use. Now, countries such as mine and other countries alike have also proper monitoring and evaluation structures. They have the infrastructure, they have the Supreme Audit Office in place, they have uh, uh, the parliament which it's, with its oversight committees. It has a ministry of planning with the national operations room going on. Everything is there in principle. But does monitoring and accountability work? That's the million dollar question. Well, in my opinion, I would say no. It doesn't work as it should. There are challenges. There are problems to be addressed. Problems that we have failed to address 
in the past couple of years for many reasons. I would take Sri Lanka as an example, my own country. And if you take it from a Sri Lankan perspective, Sri Lanka is one of the most advanced countries in terms of a monitoring and evaluation structure. Far back as 1980s, we developed the monitoring and evaluation structure. In the 1990s, we had uh, a national evaluation association. We had an evaluation culture. Then we had a national operations room established in the, uh, in the plan, planning ministry. And we had a very good system going. But in reality, what happens? We are by far the leading country in the South Asian region in terms of monitoring and evaluation. But in reality, what happens? In 2007, there was a report by the USAID which looked at uh, the uh, performance monitoring in Sri Lanka. And the report said that there was as much as 10% uh, of GDP that went for wastage and corruption in Sri Lanka. In, 2000, in the year 2007. That's a huge amount. Then there's a committee on public enterprise in parliament, which is an oversight committee, which looked at the, the results of the public enterprises in Sri Lanka and which reported that there was no evaluation, no monitoring and evaluation systems, and the, none of the projects were achieving its targets and goals. There was a severe lack of per subjecting itself to financial regulations. This is a huge adverse report which is presented in parliament. So if you look at all this, what I believe is that the evaluation community has failed to see the wood for the trees. There's something that we've missed, and that's very important. What we've missed, what have we really missed? What I believe is that in all these cases where why we've missed all out is there has been a lack of political will. There's been a lack of political champions, and there's been a lack of political buy-in. People have tended to ignore the political, the decision-making body in, in the process of evaluation, which is critical in my opinion. I, I, I can say this because I wear two hats, because I'm a politician and I'm also an uh, evaluation consultant. Because I can see that there's a huge divide between the two. And if you really look at how it has worked in some places, for example, if you take the state of Kerala in India, there is a chief minister, Uma Chandi, who was a champion of evaluation, and evaluation worked very well in Kerala. Likewise, in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, there was Omar Abdullah, who was the chief minister who pursued evaluation rigorously, and it worked very well. In Malaysia, Mahathir Mohamad championed evaluation, and it was established very well. Once you have a political champion, you have the political buy-in, you find that things change, that it's very important. So, looking at all this, why haven't we made the changes? Why haven't we taken steps to bring the evaluation community together with the decision makers, to blend them together? Because the evaluation community believed that they always blamed the decision makers. If you go to an evaluation conference, which I used to go as, uh, as an evaluator, people would say, oh, politicians, they would never listen. They wouldn't use this. They just say no to evaluation. But that's not true, really, because here I am. I'm a parliamentarian here. We have a minister, and we've met like this before. So there's the famous saying that if at first an idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. So we took an absurd idea of how to bring politicians into evaluation. A group of us, a group of parliamentarians, a few who believed that we've been left out, that we think that evaluation is a tool that will help us in our work, that it actually is not an impediment, but that it will be a useful tool for us. And we started working on it. Since 2009, we've been trying to promote this. I remember when there was an ideas conference in Johannesburg in South Africa, I went and did a panel as a parliamentarian. And in my panel, there was hardly three or four people whom I had to beg to come and sit there. Nobody wanted to listen to me, but we didn't give up. We tried to go to a few other conferences and try to make our point about bringing parliamentarians into this process of evaluation, that it was critical if you wanted monitoring and evaluation to really work. Well, in 2013, we had an opportunity in Kathmandu when the, when the community of evaluators had a, a conclave, and we were asked to do a panel. And there we had three parliamentarians, myself, one from Bangladesh, and one from Nepal, all from South Asia. And we went and did this panel. And there was quite an audience. We were happy. There were people willing to listen to us. And there was Marco Sagoni seated there. And he listened seriously. And he 
understood our concept and what we were saying. And from there, there's been no stopping because we got supported by EVAL partners. We were encouraged to move forward. And we started the Parliamentary Forum for Development Evaluation in South Asia. So with that, when we formed this South Asian Parliamentary Forum for Development Evaluation, we've achieved quite a lot. By now, we've done, we've attended over nine conferences, evaluation conferences. We've had panels. We've had a few members of parliament from the South Asian uh, parliaments. And we've had these panel discussions. And we've been able to interact with the evaluation community. But what is the Parliamentary Forum for Deve Development Evaluation? What is it trying to achieve? Well, the Parliamentary Forum for Development Evaluation is a collective of parliamentarians who are committed to development evaluation. We are a small group with the following objectives in mind. Out of, out of many objectives, some of the key objectives, I would like to say one of the main objectives is that we are trying to establish national evaluation policies in each of our countries. For example, in South Asia, not one of our countries have a national evaluation policy. Sri Lanka had a draft policy in 2003, and then the government changed. And then there was no political champion in the new government, so it fell through, and it never came up yet. None of our countries have a national evaluation policy. Why we are emphasizing on a national evaluation policy is because it makes it mandatory that evaluation is pursued, that it makes it institutionalized, that the necessary funding and the support is given for monitoring and evaluation within a country. If you know, uh, in the world over, there are only 20 countries that have national evaluation policies yet. So in this period, we're still talking about just 20 countries having evaluation policies. One of the other objectives of the Parliamentary Forum for Development Evaluation is also to create space for dialogue between the policymakers and the evaluation community. Because there's a gap, and we need to bridge this gap. And what we've recommended is that every national evaluation association has a seat in its association for the Parliamentary Forum for Development Evaluation, so that parliamentarians in different parts of the world can actually attend the evaluation association meetings, the WOPES meetings, so that they start interacting, so there'll be knowledge sharing, so that they would also come up to date with what evaluation is, because evaluation is a technical tool. So we're trying to create this space. And we've started off by having panel discussions at different evaluation conferences, coming forward as parliamentarians, as politicians, trying to interact with uh, the evaluation community. Another objective that we've talked about is improving the capacity of parliament and parliamentarians alike. As you know, our jobs are not permanent, like most of yours. We are elected for five years. We may win the next election. We may not. So building the capacity of only parliamentarians doesn't get the job done because we are in transit, more or less. right? So we've thought about developing, building the capacity of parliament itself. And one of, one of the things we've thought about is to work through the IPU, the International Parliamentary Union, to push for setting up a monitoring and evaluation unit in every parliament to have the experts who would be able to support parliamentarians. Because as I told you, evaluators in their reports, they're so sophisticated, an ordinary parliamentarian or politician wouldn't understand head or tail of it. Uh, usually, a politician would have only 10 minutes reading time in his day. And that 10 minutes would also include reading the newspapers. So in 10 minutes, you give him a 50-page evaluation report, he's not going to even look at it, right? But if you have that unit, that can summarize an evaluation report, take out what is necessary for a parliamentarian to understand and use in a debate, to use in an oversight committee, to be able to find out what he needs to look at, whether that particular project has been achieving its goals or targets, and what are the issues, then it becomes easier. So that's one of the recommendations that we've been talking, one of our objectives that we are trying to work through. So looking at all this, if you look at the Parliamentary Forum for Development Evaluation in the short time that we've been working. What are our achievements? It's been a tough call, but we've been, we've been able to do quite a bit. And we've had a lot of support, especially from EVAL partners. And one of it uh, is that right now we've participated in over nine uh, evaluation conferences. Secondly, we have also conducted, we've 
taken it upon us and conducted a global mapping exercise for national evaluation policy. We got an expert consultant to do this, and that's how we have the report to find out how many countries pursue evaluation policies, how many countries are in the process of developing evaluation policies, and how, how many countries don't even know anything about an evaluation policy. So we've done that, and we have that report. We also have a website uh, for the Parliamentary Forum for Development Evaluation, and uh, we've just started up a training program for parliamentarians, which is online on the website, uh, bringing them up to date about evaluation and what the role of the Parliamentary Forum is. We've also been able to uh, link with uh, the African parliaments, and uh, we formed the pa AFRIA Parliamentary Forum for Development Evaluation, and they're also working with the same goal in mind. We've also worked in the Middle East and in the MENA region. The women's parliamentarians have come together and they are uh, very receptive to the idea of uh, supporting the Parliamentary Forum for Development Eval Evaluation. We are also going to do many more countries in the next couple of months. We've also uh, planned to have a regional consultation in South Asia uh, in September where we will be bringing parliamentarians from each of the South Asian parliaments to Colombo where we will be having a regional consultation and uh, uh, discussing what it would take to establish national evaluation policies in each of our parliaments. So we are working on that. And we are also hoping to uh, have a, uh, the, the Evalia uh, uh, conference in 2015 in Sri Lanka at, in the Parliament House of Sri Lanka itself. So in conclusion, I know my time is up and I, need, I can't uh, take much more time. I would like to say that if the new development agenda for 2015 is going to be an improvement from the past, uh, we need to think outside the box and make changes. I think if evaluation is truly going to be a country level tool and if it is going to empower countries, then integrating the parliamentarians and policymakers with the evaluation community is essential. Thank you.